Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is linear algebra. Today, I would like to tell you a little bit about the theorem with a slightly strange name, namely Sylvester's law of inertia. Um, at the very end, I will explain where I think the name comes from, but no spoilers, so stay, stay tuned. Um, it, will be, it will be a little bit fun, but before that, let's talk maths. So there will be a notion of a signature, and the signature is basically the analog of the much more well-known Jordan normal form for a slightly different question. And that's what I'm going to explain. That's what you should keep in mind. So Jordan normal form for a slightly different question. And the question I would like to address is, let's say you have a gram matrix. What is a gram matrix? A gram matrix is a very, very easy concept. Let's say it's, it's a symmetric matrix with real entries. So I have a one entry here, I have a minus two entry here, and I have two off diagonal entries minus one and one, and I would like them to encode a pairing or in a form in exactly the following way. So V uh, paired with W is one times the one one element minus one times V one two, which is a one two element, uh, another minus one in this case, because I've just chosen it to be another minus one times this one which is a two one element. And then there is a minus two, which is a two two element times this one. It's just a, a way to uh, encode all the information in a linear form by a matrix. So the linear form that all of you know would be this matrix because this matrix would correspond to V1, V1 W1 plus V2, W2. And uh, here's another example, right? The eight is the one you put in front of one, one, and so on, whatever. The minus two is the one you put in front of one, two, and so on. Um, and note that those two matrices, so my, my A matrix and my B matrix, have a different trace, which is kind of easy, right? So this has trace minus one, obviously. Just the sum here is minus one. This thing here has clearly traced minus seven. So minus seven is not minus one, as far as we know, because we're in the real numbers. So the traces are not the same. So they can't be um, similar in this sense. They can't be in the vertebral matrix, such that one is just the base change of the other. So it's a slightly more difficult question or a different question than describe, well, this one is uh, whether two matrices describes the same linear map. And this one would be more like when, when two matrices describes the same linear, linear, linear form. And it seems to have a slightly different answer because those two matrices actually describe the same linear form up to base change. You just can't see this by, let's say, checking the, the trace or by, by, by plain sight. It's, it's just not clear. So the question you would like to answer is how we can actually decide whether in this case A and B or more general two matrices describe the same in our product. And the answer to this question will be the last time. So let's have a look or let's have a re recap. So um, there are three and actually way more notions of equivalence on matrices, three that I was trying to point out. Um, two matrices are called equivalent Two matrices are called similar, and two matrices are called congruent. And equivalent means you will find a P and a Q such that the base change gives you gives you the other matrix, right? Two different matrices, P and Q. And this is if and only if they describe the linear the same linear map, but up to a choice of of, of a pair of bases, namely one for P and one for W. And that's just a very, very inexpressive description of this problem, right? You want to want to solve um, the question whether you can decide when two matrices are equivalent. In, in just this definition, you would need to, to check basically whether infinitely many possibilities. You would need to check infinitely many P and Q. So what you would like to have is a more explicit answer, like a, like a um, just some numerical invariant, something that stays fixed under this, this, these operations, um, which tells you whether two things are equivalent. So this would be called a complete invariant in this case. And it's very easy for the equivalents. They are equivalent even only if they have the same rank. 
which is something you easily check, right? That, that's much easier to check than trying all P and Q. Um, similarly, for similar matrices, um, this is the case where you only allow one base change. You have just one matrix P, um, just up the choice of bases, and this, they describe the same linear map. And the condition here, um, the one you usually want, like, would like to check is this happens if and only if they have the same Jordan form. Okay, so if you work over C and you have reasonable nice matrices, blah, 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 they have the same, same Jordan form. So the Jordan form is a complete invariant of this question of similarity. And this is pretty good because there's an algorithm to compute the Jordan form, as there is an algorithm to compute the rank. So you can solve both questions by an algorithm instead of checking infinitely many Ps or Qs. And for the question we want to discuss today is a congruence question. The correct, um, well, equivalence relation is B equals P A P transpose. So be aware, this is an inverse, this is a transpose. So here's a minus one and here's a T. It's not, not the same question. In particular, we've already seen traces are not invariant under this operation, while they are certainly invariant under serial similarity. And it's not hard to see that this happens if and only if they are described the same bilinear form up to choice of bases. So that's easy. But still, you don't want to check infinitely many Ps and, and see, right, infinitely many Ps and, and hope to find the right one uh, in case they are equivalent. And if they are not equivalent, you will check forever because there will, no, will be no such P. So we really want to have a more numerical type of data, like please compute X, Y, and X, Y will give you uh, the answer to the question. And that's exactly the Vester's law of inertia. Okay, so you want to answer this question of congruence, which is similar to, to the other two questions, and it's this if and only if they describe the same value in their form. The question, I repeat it, would be, to find some nice numerical criteria. Here, compute this given by an algorithm and you get the answer instead of checking infinitely many potential P matrices. And how would you approach such a problem? Well, the first thing you would do basically is to generate random matrices and do some calculations. So what actually happens? So you already know that this is a condition here, so that this one, and I mean, that was easy. I haven't told you how to do it, but it's actually pretty easy to check that this is an if and only if. So that was easy. And to get to the to the lower ones, this is hard. Okay. So how do you how do you even get the statement? Well, you just chose a random matrix, whatever that means, A, and chose some random matrices P and Q. And you can define B and C. And then you check something, something that might be invariant under your problem. A good candidate are always eigenvalues. So eigenvalues in linear algebra are, are really of fundamental importance. So the first thing you might want to check is what, what about the eigenvalues? You already know that they are not fixed because you just did this calculation with the trace and the trace is of course just the sum of the eigenvalues. So they are not fixed, but you will realize very quickly a very funny pattern. So this matrix A has four positive eigenvalues and six negative eigenvalues. It's a 10 by 10 matrix that, I, that I've chosen. So A is 10 by 10. And it turns out that it has, that the eigenvalues, the 10 eigenvalues that you should expect from a random matrix. Remember, random matrices are kind of, are always as um, generic as possible. So they have, they have 10 different eigenvalues that what you should expect from a random matrix. And they split into uh, six negative and four positive. Okay, a priori, good, interesting. Maybe not, we'll see. But if you now check B and C, you see, well, the eigenvalues are certainly different. So this is a plot of the eigenvalues. They are all real because it's, I started with symmetric matrix. But what remains fixed is the number and the parity, uh, right? So all of them have four positive and six negative eigenvalues, which, if you're really honest and you have checked a random 10, actually now three random 10 by 10 matrices, this can't be a coincidence anymore, right? So really the invariant you're looking for seems to be what is called then the signature is just the, the negative minus a positive. So the number of positive and the number of negative eigenvalues. You have this counting problem of counting 
number of positive eigenvalues and the number of negative eigenvalues, which, if true, and it is true, uh, would, be, would be a very nice solution to your question, because this is an easy criterion. You just need to count signs of eigenvalues. That, that's much, much better than checking infinitely many things. And that's then exactly um, the statement. So what the Vesta's law of inertia then says is that those three things, so the number of positive eigenvalues, and plus the number of negative eigenvalues, which I call n minus, and the number of zero eigenvalues, which I call n zero. So um, there could also be zero eigenvalues, so you need to count them as well. And these are, these are invariants under congruence, and this is an if and only if criteria. So two matrices are congruent in the sense we would like to ask uh, answer. So um, for the bilinear form, if and only if they have the same parity of eigenvalues, the same number of positives, the same number of negative, and the same number of uh, zero eigenvalues. That's really nice and easy answer to that question. Um, okay. Everything here is formulated over R. There's a similar statement over C. I'm not going to discuss it. It's as usual, you have some um, complex conjugation going on. Not so important. Um, the important part is that for almost all matrices, particularly for invertible matrices, invertible matrices do not have uh, eigenvalue zero. Um, the signature, which is n plus minus n minus, the one from before, number of positive minus number of negative entries, is a complete unwrap invariant under, um, under under congruence. So just one number, the positive minus the negative. If you wonder now why is it actually that, well, how can this be true? You just told us that there are two numbers and plus and then minus. So how can one number be an invariant? Well, first of all, let me repeat, there is no n zero in this case because it's invertible. So yeah, I really only have n plus and then minus, but I all, all already know that n plus plus and minus in almost all cases will be just n, right? Um, so for all reasonable invertible matrices, so the word reasonable is missing here, um, this will be a complete invariant because I already have the information that they sum up to n. So the only thing that I additionally need to recover both numbers is the difference. And that's exactly the same. So the signature is a complete invariant for almost all matrices. That, that should be the statement here. So for almost all. And the normal form, the analog of the Jordan form is, is exactly um, this diagonal matrix, which has an N plus block with only ones, which has an N minus block with only minus ones. And there might also be an, a completely zero block of size n zero. But you just have the uh, eigenvalues on the diagonal. And in this framework of congruence, you can scale them. And if you can scale them, you just scale them to one minus one. And for zero, there's nothing to scale. OK, before we uh, go to Sylvester and his, uh, let's say, slightly weird way of naming things, um, let me repeat the, the, the Sylvester's law of inertia basically is the analog of the Jordan normal form for the question of congruence. It's a very nice answer. You basically just need to know one number, which is the signature. Okay, so why on earth is this whole thing called Sylvester's law of inertia? And I will link to some, uh, uh, to some link. I will put some links in the description below. Um, which explain a little bit about this if you want to read a little bit more about Sylvester and why he was slightly strange, but named quite a lot of things. So um, one of his biographers in this book here um, wrote the following sentence, which, which basically explains everything. So the Sylvester's law of, I just read it, Sylvester's law of poetry and language manifests itself in notable ways, even in his mathematical writing. His mastery of French, German, Italian, and Greek was often reflected in his mathematical neologism. Neo I, should, I should know how to pronounce this word. Um, I can't pronounce the other two, uh, like my cut, to whatever, and tamisage, whatever, um, which you've probably never heard before, for which he gained a certain uh, notoriety. 
So basically, she, she, she is saying he was a little bit obsessed with funny names. And then what you will find in one of these books or papers, whatever they want to call them, is what he calls inertia, the unchangeable number of integers in the excess of positive or negative signs, blah, 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 from the problem from before. So basically, he calls it inertia because he thinks it's a, it, that's a nice word. <laughs> um, and he was a little bit obsessed with giving names nice words. I will show you now his paper to kind of, you can have a look at yourself. It's, it's linked in the description, but let, 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 let me show you what you sh should look for. Here you go. So also is our little friend Sylvester and it's a book, paper, thing published in the uh, transaction of the uh, Royal Mass Society uh, about 160 years, something like that ago, oh, quite a long time. Depends a little bit when you watch this video, of course, but certainly it was a long time ago. It's a little bit longish, so it's 100 something pages, but the fun is at the very end. So at the very end, he has a five page appendix. So let's go to the very end. The five page appendix, one, four, three, four, and here's a fifth page, no, one more. Five page appendix, which he calls glossary of new or unusual terms. That's a good start. And he has a, a lot of very funny terms, which you probably have never heard, whatever. Um, but he also coined a lot of words which you have heard, uh, like, well, something you should know, is certainly inertia, inertia is in here, but also something like um, uh, matrix, matrix, the terminology matrix goes back to him. Uh, most actually never stuck, so, uh, Whatever this, whatever this is supposed to mean here, I have no idea, uh, it never stuck. So uh, anyway, but he was completely aware apparently um, that his terminology might not be completely standard. So he just calls it the glossary of new and unusual terms. It's kind of fun. Okay, summarized, Sylvester calls it the law of the inertia because he likes to call it the law of the inertia. And uh, there is no, at least not known to me really strict relation to the corresponding notion from physics. Um, he just he just thought it fits. Well, fair enough. The theorem is quite nice. So fair enough. Why not? Um, so that was it for today. Remember, recall that we've seen the Vesta's law of inertia, which basically is a Jordan normal form for this question of congruence. I hope you liked the video and I hope to see you next time.